shorter than you think. No think. Longing is the music of our sphere. The gift of life is never more or less. It starts at any time you like and ends in just a wink. Welcome to the Daily Examiner. My name is Elliot Ikele. It is my distinct pleasure to have you on board to have a chat with our special guest tonight. Without further ado, let me bring in my co-host for this evening. This is Liao Tilsley. Liao, how are you? Hello, everyone. So good to be here. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks oh, for awesome. having me. Awesome, awesome, awesome. <laughs> Oh, very, very good. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for tuning in. We want to also thank you so much for those of you guys who have been donating to our page. It's allowed us to do a few extra things, get a few extra tools and things in place. We absolutely are very grateful for that, and we want to continue building and getting stronger and stronger. Please note that if you want to have a bit of a chit-chat, if you want to have a have a, out there and have a say, chuck in a comment, chuck in a question, and we're going to make sure that we do our best to get that through to our guest here, we can discuss any of the things going. Uh, already we've got some uh, really wonderful comments coming up here. Shane Bell, and all mandates, very good. Uh, Des Watson, excellent, always lovely to, to see you there. Ross, I've missed you guys, Ah, <laughs> oh, hey, sick, sick, very good. So we'll definitely be trying to get some of those uh, comments and those questions out there. But now, without further ado, 
our guest of the hour. This is from the third time councillor. This is from the deputy mayor for two times. This is the person who wrote an article that I think was incredibly brave, and I'm sure many of you think so too, but we're going to have a little chit-chat with her right now. So please welcome to stage, Jenny Duncan. Jenny, how are you? Ah, tēnā koroa, Elias and Leo, um, and good evening to everybody who's listening tonight. Uh, awesome. It's just wonderful to have you with us. Thank you so much. Uh, look, I'm, I've got to make sure that I don't take up too much of the, the angle here because I know that Liao sometimes gets uh, irritated with me if I start talking too much. So, uh, <laughs> Jenny, yeah, thank you so much for joining us. It really was a, a powerful article. I'm going to jump in there. Mm. But, but Liao, I know that you have a couple of bits that, that you like to say and, and maybe ask. So uh, you go for it. Yeah, Jenny, I just want to say thank you so much for... Um, being, being here tonight with us and being able to be open to people's questions uh, as well as ours. Uh, but also, I just wanted to say that the very first line of your article was, was really powerful to me. And it was, it is time. The weight of my science has become too great. And I, I feel that in so many ways, that is how it, so many people feel. And I, um, I just want to honour you tonight, and I want to thank you for actually putting your voice uh, to this. Um, it's been very powerful, and so many people around New Zealand have been completely touched by it. But that very first line, it got me. <laughs> it got me. The first line is, it is time. And um, so just welcome tonight, and i uh, love to hear uh, from you. Just give us a little bit of history uh, especially in your sort of political path in Wanganui. Is, are you able to do that? Sure, sure. So just a little bit about, you know, being a councillor. I have no, had no and have no interest in being on the council ever. And the thought of going on a billboard was quite terrifying. Um, I, about nine, 12 years ago, helped our mayor, Annette Main, become the mayor. We had a mayor at the time who needed to go, doing harm to Wanganui, and so worked really hard with her to become our mayor. And a couple of years later, I was, and one of my things I was doing was president of the Chamber of Commerce, and I said to her, you know, can I do more on council or off? And I shouldn't have asked the question. And she said, oh, on council, definitely. So there I was, put my mug on the billboard and became a councillor. And... Um, one of the things that I did then, I think was quite important. I had to make a decision about what I put on that billboard. And it was around the time Wanganui was having that conversation about the H, to H or not to H. And I thought, well, you know, I believe it should be there. It's not for me to decide how Wanganui should be spelled. Wanganui is not an English word and um, should not be spelled the way that we dictate. So I put the H on all my, all my marketing material in my billboard billboards and I got in anyway, so it was not a fatal move. But what I was doing, I think, right from the start, was I was letting people know who I am and what I stand for. And if you don't like it, then I'm not a fit for Wanganui. And I was stuck, stuck with that kopapa all the way through. So everything that I've done, I've done not with myself and self-interest at heart, but what is the best thing for our community and our wider community. We have 27% um, Māori population in Wanganui, um, one of the largest one of the larger groups of you know Maori populations in the country, and they are phenomenally important. You know, of course they are, and we need to um, embrace and respect them and have them part of what we do. So that was really important. I mean, other things are quite boring. You know, wastewater treatment plants going up, going west, um, housing crisis, all that sort of thing. Normal council stuff. Yeah, well, Jenny, I know because we, we do want to discuss elements of, of your article that you wrote. I would like to just jump in there though, since we since it got brought up. Uh, what are your thoughts on three waters and, and what's happening within that space? Three waters. Well, um, it was put before us, the councillors and council of New Zealand councils of New Zealand, and I don't think it was a good faith exercise by central government. We were told in in July at the at the conference down in. Blenheim, that we had a couple of months to put together our questions and our, our views and thoughts around it. Um, but they had already made their decision to go ahead with what they were doing before they even made that statement. 
So, you know, council's a huge, huge amount of resource and council's town has to be a resource. You know, we're doing our best to keep rates down, believe it or not. And we don't want to waste resource on things that don't get a benefit directly for our community. And so she spent two months putting together all that effort, all those questions, all that deep analysis. And, and to have before them, you know, before October was out, to have the minister announce, well, no, we're mandating it. Yeah. So my view, absolutely 100% believe that we need water reform. No question about that. Um, the, the new water regulator, Tamata Arawai, really important. But early days, and the previous system didn't work, is, to, is Tamata Arawai going to work? I believe they will. But I think we should, should have just given them a year or two to do that, that regulatory work and get things on track and, and then progress the three waters. Like this, to me, there's no urgency. So I'm not currently comfortable with what's on offer. I, I like what you're sort of saying there because you're sort of suggesting around elements of operational matters. Uh, the idea of, look, you've got a, a new development that can go on. Let's let them see if they can actually activate it. Uh, however, what you're saying doesn't seem to align with the more umbrella terms that I noticed the Naya Mahuta and some of the other members of, of the Labour Party are saying. Would you mm. say that the Three Waters the narrative, the how the way that they've pushed it, would you say that there's more ideology involved than actual operational uh, skill, operational quality going on? Oh, um, and it, there might be one of those questions I might do a pass on. I'm just having a think. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, clear, clearly there's an ideology element to it. And operationally, I think you know, it's got to work for people of New Zealand, the entire community of New Zealand. Water is one of the most critical things, you know, air, then water. So I just think that it's moved too quickly. They'll say that they spent four, four and a half years, but they didn't actually do that in a detailed way. Um, yeah, it, to me, it just wasn't good faith um, partnership. It was something different, and that then raises mm. more questions for me. It, it really does. And just to let you know, we've also had just a little comment there from Christine. She says, we don't have a mayor or council in Tauranga. Our democracy has been taken away. So since, since you're here and since you are actually one of the angles, we know that the commissioners, that they are getting a hefty, they're getting funded quite a lot of money. They're getting a nice pay packet here. My understanding is that there is, I, I believe it's four of them and uh, picking up the, the very much equivalent salaries of something like 10 different councillors, so they're actually getting paid mega bucks if I, if I know correctly. What are your thoughts on the Tauranga situation in terms of that? Um, I think when you're elected to become a representative of your community, your job is to represent your community and not your own particular interests. It is also a huge responsibility to work well with your colleagues. You've got to find a way to bridge all those differences. We want difference. We want diversity, we want debate and discussion, but you've also got to find a way to bridge that and not make it um, as ugly as it became. So I, I didn't get into huge detail on Tauranga, but I did know that I think they let themselves down. And when you do it that badly, that's a consequence. So um, election this year, oh, Tauranga, I really feel for you, and I hope that you get yep. yourself a really good, um, inclusive, caring representation. I really do. Mm, no, well said. Well said. Uh, a really good scene. Now, th this is going to go in line. Ian Jones has brought up a little comment there. Before this interview, did you get the Deputy Mayor written questions, or was the interview on the fly? Ian, great, great question. Just to let you know, all of our interviews are pretty much on the fly. So... <laughs> We have a bit of a chit chat and things like that. We might have a discussion about, you know, roughly what we'll say. Uh, but what you're getting is the real deal. This is the authentic person in front of you. This is the person who's giving these answers out. That's why. That's why sometimes it can be uncomfortable. Sometimes it can be awkward. Sometimes it can be. It can be stuttering and stagging. This is. But this is what we love. And uh, you know, even ourselves, we're going off the fly as well. It's, it's a lot of it. So we want to get through, cut through, probably the pre-rigging of a situation and get into the more authenticity of the people themselves, but us included as well. So 
Great question. Uh, uh, look, I'm, I'm getting the eyes from Liao. I do apologize, Liao. No, Go for it. No. <laughs> I, um, Jenny, I just, um, I, I just wanted to ask you, um, <clears throat> I think we discussed before uh, around the article being written, but you had been thinking about this quite a bit before. So it wasn't just a reaction to what happened on, um, on that Wednesday, but can you take us on that journey as to how you actually came to writing um, this article? What was your, just briefly, if you could just check us as to okay. your thoughts and feelings way. around it. Yeah, pathway. The pathway to that article. So I guess you've got to track right back to um, COVID came, right? Okay. Um, vaccines. I made an um, uh, instinctive decision really early on, as did a number of my family. No, not for me. Um, didn't have a rationale or a, a solid, just an instinctual response to it, which followed through. Um, then we can fast forward to, you know, September last year, and it was looking like it was going to get a little bit, you know, um, a little bit stroppy. And I told the chief executive at council um, and the mayor, I, I'm, I'm not vaccinated and I'm not intending to. Um, our, we, we ended up with a, our, our, our chief executive left and we got an acting, really brilliant acting um, chief executive, told him the same story, not going to do it. Don't believe it's the appropriate thing to do. Um, but And the mayor as well. But we kept, we kept it kind of quiet and it was like, okay, Am I going to come out just because I think that I need to clear my chest and tell people I'm not? Like, there has to be a better, higher reason than that. And so we thought, well, okay, when the mandates were going to come in, I wouldn't be able to go into the council building. So maybe that's when I should say something. And as it turned out, no one could go into the council building. So that wasn't a reason to do it. And so after Christmas, it was like, you know, I need to do something about this. I'm, I'm not kind of being true to myself. So I started to write my, 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 my public statement, my coming out statement. I must have written it about eight times and the words didn't sit. They just didn't, you know, I just couldn't find those words that were really trying to express what I wanted to say because I didn't want to be controversial. I just wanted to be truthful. Um, and so this preceded convoy to Wellington, the protest. So it was sitting there, and then, of course, the convoy happened. Um, I was, I'm obviously quite well connected, looking at live streams and and, um, and, and having friends going there. And I've got a colleague, you know, a, a councillor colleague in Carterton, Jill Grapehead, and she was, you know, going to visit the, the protest area, the village. And... What I was hearing from the media and what I was seeing everywhere else was just in such a conflict. It was it was quite chilling, really. But it's very difficult to say to people who dine out on mainstream media that, honestly, you're being fed a story here. This is not what's going on because they haven't been there. They jumped in my car and went down and I spent the day in Wellington. Or well, I spent the day at, at the village. And I spent it in the village, around the village, and then I did a circuit right around Parliament buildings and really kind of felt what was going on. So this was about day 10. So it was a week, it was what, um, eight days after that dreadful Thursday when things went ugly. That had all been sorted through. And I, what I saw was um, something quite different to what people saw in the first couple of days. And I've had, like, as you know, I've had hundreds of emails and, and messages not counting thousands of Facebook posts, but the main thing that people are saying is, I found something there. There was something special there. Um, mm -hmm. It was something I hadn't experienced before. I found my tribe, I found my people, I found love and acceptance. I found something that was just so beautiful, it's hard to describe. And just comment after comment after comment, um, just, you know, tens of, maybe even a hundred of them about the beauty of being there and I felt I felt this and when I walked around the perimeter and I saw people um protesters if you like talking to the police on the on the on the perimeter and it was really peaceful 
Um, there were good conversations going on. I talked to a couple of the cops myself, just to hello, how are you? You know, friendly stuff. It was really peaceful. Um, when I just about finished my and you know, my trip right around the outside, you know, I ran into a couple, um, a mother and a daughter, and the mother wanted to go in. Obviously, you know, a local Wellingtonian wanted to go in and experience the village, and um, the daughter was very reticent, and I was standing behind them and heard this conversation. So I just piped up and said hey, you know, I've been in there. It's a beautiful place. It's really safe. And the mum turned around and looked at me and she just said, thank you, thank you, thank you. And off they went. So that, that's the beauty of it. It was so harmonious. So, I mean, you know, you had your doctors, your nurses, your, 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 your daycare, your music, your admin, your food, on and on and on and on. It was just everything there that you needed. Plus, I must emphasize, the cleaning roster on the toilets. And... Um, so I came home and got on with life, thought I would go back again, thought I would take some of my wano with me, but that never happened. And then that dreaded Wednesday happened. And I saw the few days leading up, I saw that, you know, that there was um, a, a police program on going on. There was, you know, they had this strategy, they were doing stuff with bollards, with, with other gear, um, and it wasn't ideal, but, you know, none of it was, nothing about it was ideal, except the beauty in the village. I got a message on the Wednesday morning from one of my colleagues to say something's happening. You need to get online. And I got online and to my detriment, like I said in my article, I sat there and I watched what happened. And it just freaking well broke my heart to see what was happening in our beautiful country to those beautiful people in that way. And the way it ended was just, just too much. It was just too much. So, um, I was like in a state of, 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 of trauma in a sense myself. And I think, imagine how the people who were there, who experienced it physically, and, and any children and, and, and older people, and the harm. Oh, and my husband came home. He'd been away, you know, the night before. And he came home and he got met with, I can't be a counsellor anymore. And I want to leave New Zealand. I can't live here anymore. And because, okay, um, crikey. <laughs> it sort of put him in a spot. Um, but it was an immediate reaction. So I spent three mm. days on the beach trying to get my head back into some kind of a space to get that that bad out of my body. And I didn't know what to write. So I went down the beach again, long walk, um, asked for inspiration, wrote it up and took it down to River City Press, gave it to, to Debbie, the editor, and said, have a read. Took her a hard copy, not electronic. Read this. Let me know. She had no pre-warning about what it was. She read it. And then she looked at me and she said, yes. And do you have any photos of when you were down there? And I handed her my phone and she scrolled through and she picked that one, you know, the Bob Marley one. And the rest is history. Off we went. I warned everybody. You know? I warned the mayor and the CEOs. The go outgoing one and the incoming one. I I, I warned all my family. I said, look, this is what I've done. No going back. It's oh, definitely sorry. a no no coming back yeah. on that one. <laughs> I, I, I love yeah. the photo. I thought that was a great photo. Yeah. <laughs> um, I I totally agree with you, Jenny. I, I was there for <clears throat> nearly eighteen days of the twenty three, so I I understand how the feeling of um, how people were you know there, there was always a sense of something's going to happen but mm -hmm. for the most part people wanted to um like this is a community developer's dream i mean that's that's the role i've always had but to actually see it happen and um just that uh, number eight wire sort of mentality on mm -hmm. how to fix things how to you know it was it was an incredible feeling and i, I think uh the time that you were there jenny was really the epitome of how the Freedom Village uh, was. And I'm so grateful that you were able to experience it. So out of the article that you wrote came um, not just the experience of what happened, but you were there. And mm. that, that actually speaks a lot more volume than just someone thinking they could just write something and, you know, how they express it. But you came. And so... That's another sort of honouring of, you know, of, of you as a, as a person. 
um, being mayor, you're the mayor, Hamish uh, McDowell. Is that how you pronounce this? McDowell. McDowell. Uh, so he responded, didn't he, to your article. Um, can you tell me uh, your thoughts on that? Is that is that possible for you to <laughs> give us your thoughts? Yeah, 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 that's not a past one. So Hamish knew what I was going to do. He's known in my position all along. He hasn't agreed with it, but he's, um, he's, he's known it. And if you know me, you know that my opinion is my opinion. Don't try and change it. And... I, I, I pre-warned him like other people, you know, I pre-warned him. This is what I'm, look, I can't, I can't not, I'm doing this. I gave him a copy. Um, it was out there. He, he, he wasn't happy with it, but he doesn't have to be. And he will say that himself, he doesn't have to be. Um, the, the response that he got was different to the response that I got. So he got, because these people, whoever it was that, that contacted Hamish did not contact me. So, you know. I think it's part of the, uh, oh, the system. You know how the system does what the system does, and and so he was he was put under considerable pressure around the police situation. If, if he hadn't been questioned or challenged about how dare I as the how dare I say what I said as the deputy mayor and and compromise the relationship with the police. Now I haven't read the communications he received, so I don't know the specifics, but I do know. And a number of it was about the police. And so, I mean, that's fine. He doesn't have to share my view. Um, and you, you'll know in, his, in the article there, there's a line there where he says, you know, um, I can't remember the exact words and I can't can't read off the screen. But, you know, I, I can say I have the autonomy to say what I want to say. Yep. And I think that's actually the key point in all of this. He's the mayor. I'm the deputy, I'm his deputy mayor, because the mayor chooses the deputy. Mm. We disagree. We disagree on this situation. I had my say, he had his say. Yes. We're still working together as the mayor and the deputy. He respects the fact that I'm allowed to say, or I have a voice, I can use my voice, but we still need to respect each other and get on with and do our work for Wanganui. And I think there's a strong message in there for everybody hey, somebody might come out and challenge you and say, I don't agree with what you did or how you did it. But hey, you're still a good person. I still respect you. Let's get on with what we need to do. Mm. And so I think yeah. that's your good, you can take a good message out of it. Yep. No, I think that's a, a, quite a powerful one. Excellent. Uh, I want to, just for our people out there, I, I think I'd like to read it. I'll read it pretty fast. If I hope you guys can catch what I'm saying then. Because I think it is quite important to, to just to note what he has said. Mayor Hamish McDool, he has said this. I wish to address the public statement provided by Councillor Jenny Duncan to the River City Press and published in the 10 March edition. Councillor Duncan expressed her personal views about vaccinations, the government's mandated health provisions, the recent protest action in the grounds of Parliament and the response of the New Zealand police. While I respect her right to express these views as a citizen, I'm disappointed that the Councillor Duncan's and that Councillor Duncan's position as Deputy Mayor was highlighted in the publication. I want to state that her views do not represent the position of Wanganui District Council. Our Council's current approach to vaccine passes and access to facilities is entirely consistent with the COVID protection framework settings. As COVID spreads through our community, the Council also needs to ensure we maintain enough frontline staff to continue to provide critical services to our community. Those decisions have been based on the government's advice and the best evidence available to us at this time. The safety of our community and our staff is paramount. I also disagree with Councillor Duncan's characterisation of the New Zealand police actions in Wellington. I want to acknowledge the local police who spent time serving the nation in Wellington, which stretched police resources in Whanganui. The council appreciates the partnership we have with the police and their dedicated work in our district. Mayor Hamish, yada yada yada. Uh, and, and for myself, I think that's a very carefully constructed response <laughs> that must have gone through various filters and also maybe <laughs> even some <Yeah>. advice. <laughs> However, yeah. I want to just point out something which, which struck me as very, very interesting. Uh, and I think he may have, and I have not seen how people have reacted to his statements, but I, this part here uh, is actually quite interesting. I also, I disagree with the uh, councillor, 
Duncan's characterization of New Zealand police actions in Wellington, want to acknowledge local police who spent time, all of that. Uh, I think actually he may have actually missed because I think what he's tried to do, and this is conjecture and this is my own opinion, but it looks like what he's tried to do is straddle that, that political line between saying that, that you know that the, the police are awesome and are wicked and are really responsive and therefore I'm going to be part of the community and about the protection of the community while trying to avoid that glaring elephant of the room which was there was there was two spikes of police violence escalations one on the early days and then of course on this on the last day and the fact that there are some concerning developments around uh, around what, what do you call it uh, rewards for going there not, not rewards uh, incentives sorry incentives for actually going there where we've actually seen from the from some of the uh, inspectors senior inspectors who mm-hmm. have given those those elements so i think he may have actually missed the barrel there uh, uh but i look i think the the bravery that you you did with so many politicians and parliamentarians absolutely fleeing any any look to view upon the New Zealanders, the thousands of New Zealanders who attended that, that village. I think it's incredibly brave of you to have written such a powerful document. And it was very well done, I have to say. Like, it really did encapsulate a lot of it. And you didn't, didn't shy away from anything either. Uh, I, I, from myself, no. I thought it was a powerful document anyway. Uh, what, what would have been the point to shy away? Could, could I make a couple of comments? Mm. Um, First of all, um, characterization. So it's interesting that he used the words characterization, that I mischaracterized the police. And basically, that's what triggered me to write the piece, the mischaracterization of the protesters. Because not only did I see the the, the, um, the beautiful village, and then I saw what happened when things went sour with the police, with some of the police, some of the police, and then I saw what, some of my colleagues and friends, well, sort of friends and stuff, were putting on online, you know, go to the police, you've done a great job. And it was like that real, that hurt me so deeply. It just, it was like, that's so wrong. You know, it's so, so deeply wrong. And so the miscarriage, so, so when our local police, you know, they've taken umbrage at my comments, and, and, and I absolutely, absolutely understand that. Um, but when they're feeling hurt, by my mischaracterization of them. Imagine how magnified that is with the mischaracterization of the protesters. Mm. For sure. Um, the other, because three points. The second point is, um, one of police are awesome. I've had a lot to do with our police, our police service, and our guys um, are, are absolutely freaking magic. So you know, um, if they went down there and any of them did anything bad, well, I just hope it was on a live stream when there's a consequence. But otherwise. Wong Nui Police are absolutely extraordinary. Um, and the other one is, how dare I put out there that I'm the Deputy Mayor and use that as a platform? I mean, that is just a terrible thing to do. If we notice that, that you know, um, Mayor Hamish's stuff has got Mayor Hamish all over it as well. Is that, <laughs> is that appropriate? Now, if he wouldn't have done that, the newspaper would have done it. But it's the same thing. Mm-hmm. But I tell you this here and now, if it had got out, because I think times have changed, I really do, I think we're at a completely different stage in what we're going through at the moment. Um, if two months ago it had come out that I was a, I was unvaccinated and mainstream media got hold of it, they would not have said Jenny Duncan, who lives in Wanganui, isn't vaccinated. They would have gone, Deputy Mayor, just like they did to the Mayor of um, um, Thames. Sandra you know, Gordy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, and as Sandra said, she, she's not referred to as Sandra, she's referred to as the mayor, the mayor of. And so the mainstream media would have picked up that title anyway. You know, I was never going to be just me. I was always going to be the deputy mayor. So, you know, whatever. Do you know, Jenny, um, I was just thinking, uh, can we just talk a little bit about mainstream media and uh, this what we had down there, which is, as we were down there um, reporting, we had to keep uh, debunking every day uh, the the lies that were coming from mainstream media, who were um, at the parliament grounds from there, taking photos or taking what they wanted from it. There was uh, also, there was a time when the rubbish couldn't be picked up. So 
one news went and took a photo of all of the rubbish uh, okay. lined up and said, you know, this is this is what's happening with the you know, the pr protest is a river of filth, that kind of mentality. Um, tell me something. Do you? I, I know with mainstream media, it's been um, uh, more and more it has exposed what they what their narrative is and that yes they've been paid by the government but in your perspective as a deputy uh, mayor from Wanganui has the mainstream media been like that do you think uh, leading up to this protest uh, just your thoughts around um I don't know when it started <clears throat> whether it started in March 2020 or three, six months later, I don't know. Um, but it certainly, certainly from the last election, I don't think we've seen the truth from the mainstream media. Yeah. You know, it's as simple as that. They tell, they tell, they're the mouthpiece for a government that's got an agenda. And so you don't get your unbiased. Like if you go to um, the River City Press page from just this last week, where they printed that page full of letters to the editor. It was four against, four against, four against, four against. You know, balance. Mm. We are not allowed to talk about, is there any issues around the vaccine? Has there been any vaccine harm? You don't hear about that. I've got highly intelligent, well-educated friends who have no idea about vaccine harm. They've got, they don't even know about the MedSafe website which is the government website online right. they've got no, they've got no idea that m the, the percentage of people catching COVID at the moment omicron the vaccinated have a higher percentage um who because we know that there's a hell of a lot more people vaccinated than unvaccinated but what i mean is your your probability of getting COVID is higher if you're vaccinated than unvaccinated i also think that if you've had your booster you're probably going to have an easier ride um, I will put that out there, particularly if you're older or you've got a, um, what do you call it, a, um, a comorbidity. But you don't hear those stories. You know, I saw a piece um, come up came up today, I think, about something in the Herald. The Herald had put out there that um, you're more likely to catch COVID if you're unvaccinated. And someone challenged it and they said, no, no, we're right. No, no. And then they had to do a retraction and that was that classic, you know, um, big big headline for the bad story and the teeny weeny, yeah. um, you know. In the, hey. in the third section of the... <laughs> so, um, look, in the last week, I've seen a glimmer of hope. Yeah. That's, but I haven't seen any glimmers of hope up until, up till now. I've just been gobsmacked and disappointed. Mm -hmm. and, and, Jenny, so, I mean, I know this might be you know, just going by the route. But what do you think about the mandates? Should we have mandates now? Should we be getting rid of them? Should we allow people just to live their lives a little bit more like they used to? What What are your thoughts about that whole mandate aspect? Um, I don't think that the mandates have actually helped at all. As far as the as far as as holding Omicron or Delta back. I don't think that, I don't think the mandates have, have made any difference at all. Um, our borders have, closing our borders have, even though MIQ is, you know, it's got, had some significant challenges. It, it also, you know, locked us off and kept us safe if you want to use that term for safe. Um, I think that the lockdowns, and I think poor old Auckland, you know, if you guys are in Auckland, God, my heart goes out to you because we had three weeks, not three months. Mm -hmm. I guess. But um, to a degree, those lockdowns were helpful as well. But the mandates didn't, I don't think they did any good at all because um, so many people were vaccinated and I think they were used. And I think it's been clearly stated, I think um, Baker and the PM have both said, you know, they, 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 they were a tool to coerce people into getting vaccinated. Yeah. And if you if you if you have to have that income or if you're that if you're that 
disconnected from your family that no one will have anything to do with you and, and you you do that so that you can see your family because it, you know you're, you're in that situation that's coercion mm. you know that's sort of the whole kettle of fish can yeah. work isn't it mm. so yeah, yeah so um the mandates if the mandates came off today it would still be way too late yeah. If they come off on come off on the eleventh or the thirteenth, whatever day they've both been thrown around of April, still too late. Mm. Way too late. Jenny, Jenny, um what do you think of Tapo? <laughs> Tapo. What do you think Tapo. of them dropping their mandate? Ah, <laughs> um, oh, great. And you know, I mean, I'm hoping that a lot of other councils follow suit. I really do. And and, and probably many of them are looking at it and going well, okay, what's the benefit now? Like, why are we doing it? Because actually those those unvaccinated people that Omicron was supposed to be hunting down seem to be having a bit of trouble catching Omicron, whereas the vaccinated people seem to be <laughs> um, getting it really thick and fast. And we know that unvaccinated are getting it too. Of course they are. But, you know, what's your rationale? It well, doesn't now... They quietly have uh, said that un the unvaccinated can fly in now. So my question is, what can they do when they get here? <laughs> if they're un unvaccinated, we we can't do you know you can't do most of these things. So why? Well, I, yeah. I guess it's all the Kiwis. They're saying that the Kiwis who want to come home can right. come in yeah. unvaccinated because you're allowed. Well, they could anyway, right? They could come in anyway. Um, but what they're saying is you can skip MIQ. Well, mm. why not? I mean, I'm not I'm not promoting the spread of Omicron, right? I'm just saying that it's that it's everywhere, and I don't believe people are um, taking the rat test and then reporting it in the numbers that are positive. Even the name. Probably, <laughs> sorry, yeah, I was just going to say a little bit of a, name rat. Oh. <laughs> Even yeah. the name rat for it is. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, so uh, given that it is early as to uh, their their little sneaky way that they were actually just drop that that area, and knowing what we know about this particular government, that if they give news that they think is going to get them positive reaction, they blow it up all over the place. You know, they've got memes and they've got the one pm presses, and you know they have it all over the show. Then mm. if it's bad stuff, then of course we know that it goes on a Friday afternoon. We all know this is what they do. Why do you think? they very quietly just dropped it from the site nothing spoken at all no press release no nothing absolute crickets from parliament why do you think they were very quiet about it oh i think they know the game's out i don't think it's any more complicated than that they know the game's out so they're there trying to work out their strategy to look good and you know the polls aren't working for them um there's no justification anymore. But if you were somebody who was coming back, say, from England, and you thought that you had to do, I don't know, a week in MIQ, and you had to spend, I don't know, $5,000, I don't know what it costs, um, a lot. Um, and then, you, then you're then going to land, and you you don't have to go to MIQ. It's like, <laughs> oh, that's got to screw with people's heads. I mean, it's a good mm -hmm. thing, but what if you hadn't planned for that week? Anyway. Take the yep. take the so, take the big thing. Yeah, I just think the game is well, up, and they're just, yeah, they're doing their best to to rationalise. No, well said, well said. Hey, look, I'm also I do have one question. Now. I I apologise. I loved your article, but I don't know. I don't think I read this part in there. What are your thoughts on the fact that zero parliamentarians, with the exception of David Seymour, after a massive backlash on social media and after a very negative poll result for him only then did he sort of have a little quiet on the side chat but why is it that pretty much no parliamentarian came out of uh, uh, beehive to have a discussion with the protesters do you have any thoughts feelings about that i can't tell you why but i, can, but I do have thoughts and feelings on it when when 120 mps across a number of parties are in lockstep over this and they know it's wrong then 120 mps even if their name is david seymour they the whole jolly lot need to go because none of them are standing for us 
you know, whatever it is that was going on, is going on behind the scenes, that's, that's, that's um, shutting everybody down, is fundamentally wrong. And, and they've all, all 120 of them have forgotten why they're there. Because I can assure you that if I and a number of my colleagues had been one of those 120, unless you are holding a gun to my family, different, different, different kettle of fish, I'm sure, but sure they weren't doing that to everybody. I would hope not. Um, you just say, look, I can't do this. I can't represent my country. I stood for parliament for the best for my community. What's going on is wrong. I can't stay silent. Mm -hmm. None. None did it. So they all need to go. That's extraordinary. And, and I, I, I mean, again, man, you, you, you're awesome. Far out. I mean, that. I mean, there's that, some powerful stuff right there. And you're right. It's extraordinary, just extraordinary mm -hmm. that that we have 120 parliamentarians who didn't do anything. They sat behind their beehive. They were not representatives of New Zealanders and, it's, and of, obviously, of course, the Labour Party. And what I what I have to say, what I really give credit to you for is actually be able to say that all of them, really, it doesn't matter whether they were on the right, the left, the centre, whether they were hardcore communists or hardcore libertarians. The, mm. the fact that they just refused to step out and engage with the New Zealanders who are out there were was just shocking, just absolutely mm. shocking. Sorry, Liao, you, you look like you got something there. Oh, no, I, I, what I found quite shocking was after uh, it all happened that the Prime Minister came out and uh, was uh, very concerned about the playground. You know, um, that was that was my kind of. How do you deal with that? How do you deal? So you know, the word minister means to serve, and that was that was <laughs> that was her response. Was how sad she was about the playground. Um, I just had no words from mm. from that particular mm. one. No, absolutely right. And, and look, just so that you know, yes, Karen, Karen, you're absolutely right. Matt King and Winston did go down to talk. I did make mention that it was parliamentarians who did not come out, but you're absolutely right, Matt King, and my understanding is that his party is now called Democracy New Zealand, and Winston Peters of New Zealand First did go down, they did talk, and I think that was actually a really wonderful thing. Matt King, great speaker, spoke really strongly at the, the area there, and of course, Matt King also happens to be, my understanding is, the, the one of, or if not the spokesperson for United We Stand, that was of course the group who won their battle for the judge to say that the mandates were illegal for police persons as well as defence personnel. So I think, and in sense, straight after that element, uh, straight after that win, that's when we started to see the government start to relax on some mandates to not push it so much, and we also saw some of the councils. Jenny, what are the current... Uh, I guess lockdown or what's the current rules in terms of COVID for the Auckland uh, for the Auckland Council, sorry, for the Wanganui Council facilities? They're, they're the same as most other places that have taken lockdowns, you know. Um, no, no vaccine pass, no access. But but in, in defence of Wanganui, if, at all, if that's at all possible, you know, we've had an acting CEO, really, really great guy, I might I add. Um, he finished up a week ago and our new CEO started last week. So we've got a new a new CEO and um, I wasn't prepared to jump on him on his day one and say, get rid of the mandates because he needed to actually find his desk, you know, he needed to get to Wanganui. But I'm sure he's looking at it. I'm sure he's looking at it. I mean, I, if it wasn't for what I'm hearing in the, in the media all the time now about the relaxation of the mandates in general, it would be my number one thing to to really go for in the coming week. But I'm thinking, you know, just we just need to put pressure on them to do it sooner. They're going to do it. We just need them to do it sooner. We really do, because if you're if you're if you're vaccinated and getting on with your life, the 12th of April is tomorrow. Mm -hmm. But if you're a person who can't do sport or a person who can't go to work. That's a month. You know, that's hideous. So. Mm. No, well said. Yeah, well said. 
Well, look, I think we're coming to the end of our time together. It's been just an absolutely amazing, amazing chat. Thank you so much for for you as a person, and especially, you know, you as a person is important, but we, we desperately need political leaders who are prepared to have a yeah. backbone, to have strong strength, and also to defend the rights that New Zealanders appear to have forgotten in some cases. Uh, so I want to say thank you so much for coming onto our show uh, also. Liao, do you have anything last to sort of add? Yeah, I ask? do. <laughs> Just one more question, Jenny. Where to from here? What? Ooh, yeah. how, you, how do you see uh, this going? Like, I think there's clearly two pathways here, <laughs> you know, of the dropping of the mandates and carrying on with our lives, but I just wanted to just get your sort of thoughts around uh, where you see this this pathway heading. I think there's two aspects to that, really. There's the what is the political pathway and, and what, what more is going to happen and what more are they going to do. And that will come through via different kinds of legislation and probably not through COVID. So being aware of that so and being aware um, of what's behind things because we've we've allowed things to happen and we haven't realized the deeper issues and the deeper connections to this kind of thing the other side of it is our own personal behavior so this is going to end soon you know six weeks time maybe it might be kind of over if you like from the structural point of view and we can feel um Sure, there's a lot of trauma for a lot of people in a lot of areas. Um, and there's a lot of truth that needs to come out. That's between ourselves and, if you like, the government. But when it comes to our day-to-day lives, we've got to be we've got to be personally the way that we want other people to be. So we have to care. We have to do um, as much araha to each other as we can. We have to care as much as we can for ourselves for our family, for our neighbours, our community. That's the important thing. That's the one thing that we can do, the one thing we can control. The other stuff we can't control, we can try to influence, but we can't control. But we can control ourselves. And yeah. so do you want, do you want it, like, I mean, I people say to me, um, oh, I'm never voting for Labour again, I'm going to vote for National, or National, you know, National's it, not Labour. And I'm thinking, you know, there's just two sides of the same damn coin. And so if we behave with vengeance and anger and retribution towards our community, I'm not talking about the government, towards our community, to, to each other, we are just like them. We have a responsibility to be the best we can, the best we can be, and that is to rise above what's happened. Don't forget, for sure don't forget, but we, we just need to look after each other. We need to get back to trusting, caring, and loving each other. Mm, well said. Beautiful words. Oh, wonderful, wonderful words. Well, Jenny Duncan, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Jenny is, of course, the uh, she's third-time councillor. She's also second time as deputy mayor. Absolutely wonderful. I believe that the elections are coming up this year as well. So make sure that if <laughs> you're me, in Wanganui, you support Stay some people. We... We desperately need such people who have got strength and verve and backbone. It's absolutely necessary Mm -hmm. for us to have. But in the meantime, Jenny, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Uh, We're so happy to have you with us tonight. Thank you. You guys are an absolute delight. (laughs) And for all of our audience out there, thank you so much for joining in. Thank you so much for coming in and for your comments. I can still see them flooding all over the place. It's absolutely wonderful. In the meantime, Keep care of yourselves. Just like Jenny said, we've got to have more love. And in the meantime, thank you for joining in. God bless you and God bless New Zealand.